So uh, thanks so much for coming to our uh, second IDSS Distinguished Speaker Seminar this semester. It's great to see everyone. And this is getting recorded, so hence the mic. I'm uh, delighted to be introducing uh, Professor Kwapna Donkor. He's an assistant professor of marketing at the Stanford Graduate School of Business. And he's presently here at Sloan visiting us as an MLK visiting assistant professor. He earned his PhD in agricultural and resource economics from UC Berkeley. And he has a remarkable experience that he brings to, to a lot of his work. I think it really informs your empirical work in very interesting ways, having worked as a yellow taxi driver in New York City. Um, your work is such an interesting mix of things. I, I just, uh, I, I found it fascinating. I mean, ranging from tipping norms in the taxi industry ever since uh, default tipping was introduced as an option and all kind of what technology affords us in that context, identity-based biases in a range of sectors from corporate strategy to public health. And I, some of these we'll see uh, today. And then the impact of the Affordable Care Act on seasonal farm workers' health outcomes on some of your other collaborative work. And just generally work that really bridges the gap between economic theory and practice and actual real world applications. So thanks so much for being here. And we are delighted to get to hear more about identity and economic incentives and those really cool applications on sports betting. Thank you. Well, thank you for having me. Um, I don't know, is this too loud or? It's perfect. OK, OK, great. Well, thank you all for uh, coming. Um, I want to share with you guys uh, this project that I'm really excited about. Uh, from what I eaves eavesdrops on, uh, apparently you do some sports stuff. <laughs> and so yes, so, so I'm expecting all your questions here. Uh, um, Oh, he's also coming to dinner. OK. OK, so you can save the mean ones for dinner. <laughs> OK. OK, so we're going to talk about identity and economic incentives. And this was uh, joint work with uh, amazing co-authors. Uh, some of them were um, classmates in grad school. And, and most of the people on here love soccer. So I'm going to be talking a lot about soccer. But you would realize that the, 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 the talk is not really about soccer. right? Um, so, so I just want to point, point out this relationship here. Uh, that identity matters. I don't need to convince you of this. Like you talk to sociologists, you talk to political scientists, um, marketers. Well, talk to anybody, and they'll tell you that identity matters for choices uh, that people um, make. And of course, I've drawn this arrow, sort of maybe saying that you know what identity kind of like causes or you know has an impact on on the choices that people make. Um, but today, when we think of identity, or you know. Um, um, as we go through this talk, this is how I want you to, this is the framework that I want you to have in mind. Okay, so identity is going to impact choices before I had the straight line that's coming straight to choices. But I'm gonna say, well, it's gonna impact choices through two channels, right? It's gonna impact your choices through beliefs uh, and then to choices. So what I'm saying is my identity, my shape, the way that I view the world, you know, what I believe to be true uh, about the world and what I believe would happen because I have um, uh, because you know, I identify in a particular way. Uh, but it's also going to impact um, my preferences, right? Uh, which impacts choices. So let me just make this a little bit more con concrete. Um, um, so, so imagine that uh, I am a conservative. Um, and then let's say I see Trump on the campaign, uh, uh, campaign trail, and then he has some set of uh, policy you know, proposals. Um, because I'm conservative, and let's say I'm sort of like in the same identity as him as a conservative, you know, I believe that his policies are actually going to be um, good for the, for the country in the future if he becomes president, right? So those are my beliefs because I'm a conservative and, and, and he represents my values. And then you can think of the other, the preferences are, well, because I'm a conservative, I'm always going to rank a conservative candidate higher than I would um, uh, a candidate who's not conservative. So, so when I talk about preferences here, I'm thinking about rankings, right? So I'm going to rank a conservative much higher uh, than I would uh, somebody who is not. And then the beliefs is about you know what I think the world, um, how I think the world looks like based on the fact that I identify a particular way, right? Uh, but of course, um, you can think of cases where we can also draw like an arrow from beliefs, also impacting preferences, and then going into choices or um, going from preferences uh, into beliefs, uh, and then. Um, and then into, into choices. 
um, for, for our purposes today. I'm going to measure these things directly. Um, and for preferences, it's going to be revealed preference in, in, in the work uh, that I'll be showing you later on. So that's, does this make sense? This is the framework that we're going to be using? OK, great. Um, OK. But then there's a fundamental identification problem in, in most uh, work in causal inference or when we're studying choices. Most of the data that we have, we would observe, we would, you would have a data set where you would see all the choices that, let's say, consumers made or individuals made, right? But what you don't observe is you, you don't observe what they believed when they were making that particular choice. Um, and, you know, so, so really when you observe that particular choice, how do you distinguish between the influence on beliefs on the choice that you actually but you've actually observed within the data set, and you know what was the impact of preferences on, on that particular choice. And so the way that um, at least economists would think about this would say, well, um, we're going to assume that beliefs follow a, a particular process. You know, we're going to say that people have rational expectations, right? Or you would have Mansky would say, well, why don't we actually measure beliefs directly and then account for that um, um, in the data? Well. Now, now let me give you another example of where you'd see the challenge of like sort of distinguishing between beliefs and preferences. So let's go back to my example of me being a conservative and then I vote for Trump, right? So now you've seen my vote. I voted for Trump. But again, what, what explains my vote? Is it because I rank Trump over, let's say, um, Hillary? Or is it because I believe that Trump's policies are actually good for the country, and so therefore I voted for him. So, so you see this challenge of like, if you observe my vote, you can't really tell me, well, 90% of my vote was influenced by my beliefs, and then the other 10% was influenced by, by my preferences, right? Um, and then, and then um, why is this important? Let, let me share that with you after, after this slide. I'm not going to spend too much time over here, um, but I have two bullet points here. Every, I have to press this twice every time for, for it to move, so it's a little bit confusing. Um, OK, so, so, so there's, set, there's a ton of literature on identity. That's the point that I want to make here. Um, and you know, when it comes to beliefs, you know, there's evidence of over-optimistic beliefs. For example, sports fans, you know, they think that their team are, is always going to, going to win. You know, that's wishful thinking. Um, and then when it comes to preferences also, um, you actually have this Morridge uh, paper that's very close. It actually uses the same context as we, we do where they say, you know what, would you like to get a free mug or would you like to get money um, if your team like, loses the game and people are like, no, do not give me that money, right? And so in that sense, they sort of shut down the beliefs channel and then um, are really exploiting the preference channel over here. And then you also have some theoretical models, um, really more formally in, in economics by Arkeloff and Cranton in 2000, which I think, I believe it's a book, and then the paper is, maybe this is the paper and then that's a book, where um, economics is starting to take ver uh, uh, identity very seriously and also these channels um, that impact people's, people's behavior. Um, so, so what are we going to talk about today? We're only going to answer one question. The only question we're going to answer today is, how does identity affect investment um, decisions? Right? That's the question that we're going to ask today. Let, let, me, let me try and see if I can fix what's going on here. Try this one more time. OK, perfect. It's working now. So how does identity affect the incentives to invest? And then what I'm going to show you today is I'm going to show you a theory, right? I'm going to show you a model um, that's going to be thinking about how people are going to be making portfolio allocation, uh, allocations, right? So imagine you have some budget that you have to invest, right? And you're going to have different um, uh, uh, assets that you can invest across. And then you can think of some of those assets as things that you have sort of some sort of association with, um, and others not so much, right? And then we're going to take that theory. Um, and then we're going to run a field experiment using the predictions that the model is going to tell us. The model is going to tell us a set of predictions that we should find if our theory actually holds. And then we're going to run a field experiment and actually test um, those predictions. And then after we do that, we're going to have a structural, we're going to, we're going to play some structure on the model that we wrote here in order to be able to say something about, well, 
if we know something about people's beliefs and then if we also know something about people's preferences in the structure of the model, then we can say something about, well, if we see a person, let's say, vote for Trump, 50% of that came from beliefs and then uh, the rest came from preferences. So that's what the structural part is going to be doing for us. We're going to distinguish between the impact of identity um, through beliefs and then um, what comes through uh, preferences. So I'm going to stop here if there. I guess yeah. like maybe you have like a set of beliefs that informed your identity as a conservative. Yeah, no, that's 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 a very good question. Um, you can think of a case where somebody might come up with a theory where your choices might actually also feed back into your identity, and then you keep going back and forth. Um, for my purposes today, I'm not going to talk about that. I'm going to take identity as given, and then we're going to have make we're going to um, um, have people make choices uh, and also measure their beliefs and then see that impact. And I think what I'm going to show you with the data is we don't really have to worry about this feedback loop um, because these are identities that people have held for a really long time, and so we can consider them as exogenous um, for, for our purposes. But yes, uh, the, the model is not going to address that. OK. Um, so really quickly, uh, um, the reason why it's really difficult to sort of separate beliefs uh, from preferences um, is that you would have to have the same decision with and without identity concerns. What do I mean by that? Well, I'm the conservative who voted, but you also want to have me vote in an election where I actually don't support any, any, any of those candidates and actually see what I'm going to do. Or you would have to have me invest in a set of assets where I have no connections to those assets and then also put me in that same situation and then turn on the fact that I actually have associations with some of those assets. And it's really, really difficult to be able to do that. Um, and even if you're able to do that, how do you get somebody to do that multiple times, right? We only vote four years every, every four years and whatnot. But what we're going to do in this paper, um, we're actually going to have the same decision um, where in some cases where identity is switched on, and then in the other cases they're not. Uh, and then we're going to have a survey measure of identity. So it's going to be in the context of uh, the Premier League. I don't know how many of you are familiar with the Premier League. Any Europeans in here? OK, OK. Well, I think, I think Americans now also know a lot about the Premier League now. Uh, <laughs> um, OK, so, so the context uh, for the fuel experiment is going to be the Premier League. So this is the 2021 Premier League. Um, are we actually going to ask people a month before the league starts, we're going to send them a survey where we're going to ask them a bunch of useless questions. And one of those questions in there is like, hey, do you follow the Premier League? You know, how much do you follow it? What team do you support? How much do you support them and whatnot, right? And then a month, they, they don't know that they're going to be, uh, you know, um, doing an experiment on the Premier League per se. But then when their league starts, then we're going to start sending them um, surveys where it's like, hey, look, uh, this weekend is going to be five games. These teams are playing and whatnot, and then we're going to give them some money to, to bet. But I'll explain, I'll explain further. Um, OK, so the, the other contribution is going to be this idea of like disentangling the impact that identity is going to have on people's beliefs right, and um, uh, their preferences. Well, we're going to measure your beliefs directly. So imagine um, a week before the game, I'm going to come to you. I'm going to say, you know, they have five uh, games this weekend. Um, team A is playing Team B. Uh, what do you think is the probability that team A wins? Um, and then we go to the next game, and then I'm going to elicit your beliefs that way. Um, and then really the experimental variation is going to come from the fact that after we've elicited your beliefs, I'm going to say, well, this is, this is a budget that you have. These are the potential outcomes of the game. You allocate it however way you want across these outcomes. And then when the games are played the following week, I actually pay you um, if the if dependent on how you you essentially um, invested your money, I would pay you what whatever returns comes with that. But I decide what the returns look like. So what you should have in mind is there are going to be cases where I'm going to make it really lucrative for you to bet against your team, and other cases. And then you're going to be doing this across games where you're neutral and games where you're non-neutral. Um, well, so the experiment is also going to be both in the UK and also in Kenya. So we're going to have the same experiment. These people are betting on uh, games in the same league, but then we, we do it both in Kenya and 
in the UK. And then you're going to be doing this not only once, you're going to be doing this throughout the whole season, right? So you're gonna bet like in the beginning of the season and also be um, um, doing the same exercise at the end of the season. Okay, so, um, so why is it important to, to disentangle um, beliefs from preferences? We know that identity matters, but I mean, if we know that you know, identity would shape the way people make choices, well, once we see the choices, why don't we just come up with, with policies? Well, it, it's important, for example, let's, let's just take the sustainability and climate change example over here, um, where you, know, you, know, you might just have some people who just don't believe in the science behind climate change, right? And if that's really the issue, then probably what you want to do is you want to use an information campaign, educational programs to get people to sort of like, you know, recalibrate and, and get the correct information. And that um, might change their sustainability uh, behavior, right? Um, but if it's not beliefs, that's the issue here, and really it's preferences where they're saying, you know what, um, I don't care what's going to happen in 100 years from now. I want to enjoy myself, right? So I don't really care about the, the planet, right? Um, and so they prior, prioritize immediate economic gains over, you know, uh, long-term long sustainability gains because they're not going to be here. Then how, it doesn't matter how much information you give them. They don't really care about that. It's not that they have the science wrong. It's just that they care about today rather than tomorrow. Um, then the policy implication is very different, right? So here you might want to give them subs you might want to subsidize, let's say, sustainable um, behaviors or give people penalties. So you can see how the policy would really vary dependent on the channel through which the channel that impacts people's choices, right? And so that's why it's important um, um, to separate beliefs from from preferences. You can think of the case of let's say COVID. So it might just be that I don't believe uh, that the vaccine is really good, right? Um, and so in that case also you can use information campaigns. But it's really, I'm an anti-vaxxer and it doesn't even matter what the science is. Well then you can spend a lot of money on information campaigns but it's still not gonna work because that's not what's driving um, behavior but it's really this preferences and so therefore maybe you want mandates uh, and things like that. So the policy uh, implications are very different depending on what drives uh, behavior. So I'm going to talk about the experiments next, um, show you some reduced form evidence from um, the experiments. We're going to go into the theory, then we're going to do the structural stuff. Okay, and feel free to jump in at any time. Um, okay, so let's uh, experimental design. So people are going to tell me what teams they support. I think I told you a little bit about this earlier. Um, and then uh, for, for the teams that they support, so that's going to give us a sense of like what the identity is, but also I would show you data that they're actually going to reveal this also in their actions based on how they bet. Um, and then we're gonna measure beliefs. This is going to be self-stated. You're gonna tell me what's the probability that the home team wins, the away team wins, or draw. And then what's cool about this setting also is, you know, when I ask you what's the objective minimum wage, depending on whether you're conservative or whether you're liberal, you're gonna give me very different numbers. But then who's biased in, in the estimate that they just gave? Well, there's no objective benchmark for you to be able to say that one person is biased and then the other one uh, isn't, or one person is biased this way or the other way. So because we don't have these objective probabilities, it's hard to say who's biased and who isn't. But this is a context where there's a lot of data on, on, on soccer games you know, going back, um, I, I don't know how long, but for these games, even Google puts up um, odds before the games are played. So we have enough data, then they use these machine learning models to come up with um, uh, um, the odds. And so we're gonna take that as some form of like an approximation of what's objective. And so now if you tell me what your stated probabilities are on a game where you're sort of like neutral because you don't support any of the teams versus games where you support one of the teams, we can sort of like benchmark you against um, these objective probabilities and see you know, which direction, in which direction you're, you're, you're biased. Okay, so once we do the beliefs uh, part of things, now we're gonna present them with an identity consumption trade-off. That's just you know, how much money you wanna take home from uh, your investments. So for each game, uh, you're gonna allocate a budget of 100 tokens. What 100 tokens mean in Kenya is 100 Kenyan shillings, 
right? So each token is, 100, uh, is one Kenyan shillings. Um, the hourly minimum wage is like um, 60 Kenyan shillings. So this is not a trivial amount for somebody who's in, who's in Kenya. Um, and then in the UK, it's two pounds. That's how much we give them. Um, and then what we're going to do is we're going to randomly assign the odds. You should think of that as the asset returns. So I'm going to tell you, you know, Chelsea is playing Arsenal. Um, and if you put your money on Chelsea, I'm going to multiply by five. But if you put your money on Arsenal, I'm going to multiply by, let's say, two. Right? But I'm the one who's choosing what the asset returns are going to be. Um, and we'd randomize this at the individual level. And it's going to be different for each game um, that you're going to bet on, each one of these four or five games that you're going to bet on. So that's, that's the, um, that's the uh, exercise that the participants have to do. And then after each match day, um, we're going to randomly select one of these games, and then we're going to pay you um, whatever you made. So that's the experiment. Any? OK, great. Um, OK, so let me just show you some sample characteristics. Um, so there's a total of about 1,600 participants in the UK and then uh, about 800 in Kenya. Um, there's about 40,000 individual match um, bets uh, that we observe here, 20,000 in, in the UK and then 20,000 in Kenya. Uh, and then to your question about uh, people's identities, if we just look here, the number of years that people have been following the league um, in the UK, again, the UK sample is also much older uh, than the Kenyan samples, but they've been supporting the team for about 24 years right, um, in the UK, and then um, in Kenya for about, um, about nine years. So uh, we're going to take it as you're not about to formulate your, the team that you support during our, our study. But, um, so we're going to take that as giving uh, here, given the sample that we have. Uh, of course, there are uh, more males who, who watch these games. OK, so now let's look at the setup. Uh, this is what you have to do. I think I explained this already, but the soccer fan is going to bet on one of three potential outcomes, right? So the home team wins, which is the H, away team wins, or there's a draw. right? Those are the potential outcomes of each game. Um, and for a soccer match, you're going to have an identity. You're either going to be a supporter of one of the teams or you're going to be neutral, right? right. So that's, that's the setup. Um, and then this is the decision that you have to make. So you come in, you have three outcomes. We're going to give you a budget, which is 100 Kenyan shillings if you're in Kenya. And then you're going to decide, you're deciding what XH is. So how much are you going to put on the home team? How much are you going to put towards the away team and then the draw team? And then I'm going to decide this. This is the asset return. So this is what I said. If you choose XH, I'm going to multiply by 3. Or if you choose XA, I'm going to multiply by theta A. Right? So that's, that's the exercise that you're doing. And this is what your payoff is going to look like at the end. Right? Um, and so this is an example of uh, what an, a participant would see. So here is a game between Chelsea and then Man City. Right? And then I'm saying, well, for every for one token that you put towards Chelsea, if that outcome is realized, I'm going to multiply by 2.14, right? If you put it toward, towards Man City, I'm going to multiply by 3.47, right? And this is not the case of like you don't know how to do the calculation. You don't know how much you're going to make. Because once you place your tokens in here, I'm going to calculate and show you exactly how much you're going to make, right? You put uh, in the draw amount, and I'm going to um, calculate it. So this is not an issue of like I don't know how much I was going to make um, for this particular um, investment decision. So now let's look at what uh, participants actually do uh, in this experiment. So this is the UK sample. What I have here on the um, uh, the ho horizontal axis here is uh, whether you're a home team supporter, whether you're neutral, uh, or whether you're an away team supporter. And then what I have on the uh, vertical axis is essentially the share of your um, budget that you allocated towards the different outcomes of the game. So here the blue is a way win. Um, the mustard is a draw, and then the red is home win, right? And so here, if you look at home team supporters, they put about 50% off um, their budget towards the home team winning, about 20% on the away team uh, on a draw, and then 31% on um, the away team. And it's sort of flipped when you come to the away team supporters, right? Where you're putting about 47, 
um, versus 33% on the away team winning. And then when people are neutral, they put about 40 and 40 on the away team and then put um, And this is not the case where people are just moving to the corners. Um, so let me just show you a distribution here. Um, so this is just the unconditional distribution of budget allocations. The way you should read this is essentially for the mustard one, this is um, essentially the distribution of tokens towards the home team winning, and you can see that they put a lot of their um, tokens towards the home team winning if they're a home team supporter, right? Um, and then you see they put fewer tokens on the away team winning. So this is not an issue of people that just jump into the corners and put in everything there. Um, there's quite a bit of variation in, in how much people are um, putting across the different outcomes of the game. Very similar figure when you get to Kenya, right? 50% uh, again, and then 32. Um, you have 50% uh, for the away team, and then 31%. So very, very similar betting patterns, whether you're in uh, Kenya or in the UK. So, yes, yeah, so, so, so if they were just in the corners, um, I would just jump and say people are risk neutral. If people are risk neutral, um, then people would just go to the corners. And so that tells us that the model that we write down, we can't just write down some model that says that people are risk neutral and therefore they would jump into the corners. So we're going to have to take into account um, risk preferences here, given that we're thinking of a portfolio choice. Um, yeah, so, so it's a risk, uh, risk preference case. But, but then again, also you might think that maybe all these differences is not really attributed to identity, it's just risk preferences. And once we take into account risk preferences, it will explain all of this data. Um, but we're going to find out whether that's the case or not. OK, so, so this is everything that I showed you earlier, sort of like unconditional. But here, I can take into account individual fixed effects because I see people over time and then match fixed effects. And then um, the effects will stay. So the way you're supposed to read this is how much did I place on the home team winning? Um, if I'm a home team supporter relative to the neutral fans, I put about 8.6 more tokens on there. Um, but then uh, if I'm a away team supporter, I put less on there. Right. So. Um, the estimates survive um, when we account for individual uh, and match fix effects. Okay, now we're, th those are where the re reduced form stuff that I wanted to show you for um, how people, you know, essentially place their bets. And if I was like, just all I cared about was like the experimental stuff, that's where I would stop. I would show you that, look, if I put in um, the person's identity, I can show you that people put more on their on their own um, team versus not. But I couldn't tell you anything about whether it's really driven by their beliefs or their preferences, right? We couldn't say that. So elicit in beliefs, same idea. Chelsea, Man City, you would give me your probabilities and they have to sum up to, uh, to, to one or 100% here. Um, and we're not incentivizing beliefs here. So, so that's one thing to keep in mind. We're not incentivizing beliefs here because that would essentially be betting. Um, so we're not incentivizing that over here. Uh, if you have problems about that, um, I'm going to tell you about how we address if you're worried about measurement error. Remember that we actually have uh, data on what the objective probabilities are. You can think of that as an instrument for um, these subjectively reported uh, beliefs. So that's what we're going to do. So what do people report? Uh, the way you're supposed to read this is everything that's towards me is more probable than everything that's away from me. right? And so if you're a home team supporter, you think that the home team is more likely to win. That's why the blue is much closer to me. If you're neutral, you're sort of in the middle. And then away team supporters think that the, um, the home team is less likely to win. Right? So this is what this is saying. This is in the UK. Very similar pattern also um, in, 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 in Kenya. OK, so again, we can account for individual and match fixed effects. And then that pattern continues continues to hold. OK, so what have we seen so far? Um, I think one thing that I didn't point out was that if we compare essentially what this adds up to is that there's this um, gap here that we, that we sort of care about right here. right? So where is this extra gap coming from? Like, why are you not behaving like somebody who's neutral? 
So this is the thing that we want to explain, and we want to say, well, how much of this extra that's coming from this 50 is um, explained by beliefs, and how much of that extra is explained by, by preferences? That's the goal of the study, right? Why are you not behaving like this guy? Who's, why are you not behaving like when you're neutral? So that gap that I just showed you um, is about beliefs. Uh, sorry, it's, it's about 20%. So does this 20% supporter versus neutral investment gap that we see, uh, which I just pointed out to you. And then we also know that people are sort of more overconfident when it comes to their team winning versus um, the opposing team. So what explains this gap? Well, let's go into the theory. So we're gonna start off with this theory where we're gonna say that identity does not impact anything. That's, that's gonna be our assumption going in. Identity is a thing, but it doesn't really matter for choices. Um, and then the null hypothesis that we're going to check, uh, we're going to test for here is that team allegiance, right, um, does not influence your um, investment decisions compared to when you're neutral um, after I account for your beliefs and then the risk preferences, right? Because we could argue that maybe your risk preferences just explains all the data that we just saw. Um, so after I account for your beliefs, your betting odds, and then risk preferences, we shouldn't see any differences. So we're going to take a standard um, subjective expected utility model here. So this is your, the probability that you think that the home team is going to win. Um, just multiply by the utility that you gain from the return from your, um, from your bet, right? Same idea here for the away team and then the draw. Um, and then I'm going to make the strong assumption that people have uh, carry utility, right? So it takes this form over here. And this R parameter here is going to pin down people's risk preferences. When I throw that in there and I solve for the first order conditions, it says that well, this is how you're going to be making your allocations. If you're, as a neutral person, we have already assumed that identity doesn't matter. Um, this is wh what you're going to allocate. Uh, this might look a little bit messy, but it's not too bad. So what you should focus on here, I just want you to focus on here. Um, this says that the probability that the home team wins for person I, just multiply by theta I. This is the sort of like the marginal return that you would get for placing uh, a dollar on the home team winning just um, essentially normalized by the draw outcome. And here is also the marginal return that you get from the away team winning just normalized by the return from draw. And so really you should think of this as a wedge between the return from home team winning and the away team winning. And so if this value is much bigger than that, then you put more in the home team winning. Same idea here, right? So um, if the return from the away team winning is much higher than the uh, home team winning, then you put you allocate more towards the away team. So that's that's all this says. And again, um, if we look at this closely, what I'm going to observe here, for example, people's votes. I'm going to observe how much you placed on the other team. You can think of this as an OLS regression, right? Um, where everything here is data because I'm providing it. Everything in here, you told me what your beliefs are. These are all data, so I can have this object regress this guy, let's think of this as a constant, and then the coefficient on this delta P term is going to pin down your risk preferences. And so that's how we're gonna pin down risk preferences, right? But again, I mean, if we're thinking of the structural model, um, we have sort of two equations just to pin down this guy. So we're sort of over identify. I can double my data set um, just because I have these two um, first order conditions. Um, okay, so um, our null hypothesis says that Identity doesn't matter. We know we can account for risk preferences. We know we can account for uh, people's beliefs. Um, and let's, again, if you think that these are measured with error, you can think of this delta P term being instrumented with a similar delta P term, but then substituting this for um, the bookmaker preferences and using that as, as an instrument. So that's what we're going to do. Um, and let's see what happens. Let's just run that regression and just say, Let's put a delta P term on this um, uh, horizontal axis and then just the XH term, which is gonna move this over um, to the vertical axis. So essentially, like I told you, if let's say the probability of the home team winning is way much higher than the marginal return from the away team winning, you should put more in them, right? That's this relationship that we see over here. Now this is what you would do when you're neutral. If we've, and, and we've accounted for your risk preferences and for your beliefs, and so if I plot the same figure when you are 
um, a supporter of the team, it should lay literally on top of this thing, more or less, right? But this is what happens. You lay above um, the mustard line. When you're an away team, you lay below it. So essentially what we're seeing here is we're, we're violating the, the, the null hypothesis that we came up with. We say if we account for your risk preferences and account for your beliefs, we should not see any differences across uh, just based on your identity. And we see these wedges um, um, that are coming from your identity. And this is what we're going to be pinning down. That's the preferences for identity, essentially. Okay. Okay. Same idea when we go to the UK. We account for people's beliefs, people's preferences, the returns to assets, and we still see this, these patterns um, in there. Okay, and then now I can show you the regression version, but I think uh, the picture was much clearer uh, than going through these. But essentially the idea is these are the wedges that I showed you in the, in the figure. Okay, so highlights now we know that even when I account for your risk preferences, your bet and odds, and then subjective beliefs, we still see this gap between uh, when your identity switches on versus when you're, when you're neutral. So now we're gonna come back and say, well, let's think about the model that we wrote down. Now let's include identity, um, how identity is going to impact people's choices. But I wanna give you just sort of like a conceptual way of like thinking about the model that I'm gonna write here. So the idea is that your beliefs is going to be distorted by your identity. So identity is going to shape the way that you think about the world. Those beliefs may be distorted uh, or motivated. We're not really going to take into account how uh, the belief formation process here. So here, an example would just be, you know, I'm an environmentalist um, and, you know, I believe that the future is going to be green. And so therefore, I'm not going to put my money uh, in oil and gas because I believe that in the future is going to be unprofitable, right? So that's how my identity as an environmentalist is going to impact my beliefs. Or for example, I'm an anti-vaxxer, you know, and I just believe that uh, beliefs don't, uh, vaccines don't work. For the preferences, the way we're gonna think about them here is that, you know, whenever I have, an, uh, you know, I, my actions are identity incongruent, there's a psychic distress. So you can think of it as because I'm an environmentalist, I feel terrible about spending money that I just made from this oil and gas company because it's actually polluting the world, right? So that's, that's, that's the psyche that you should, um, that they have uh, in mind in, in this model, right? Or, you know, taking a vaccine just feels like, you know what, I didn't stick with um, my group. Um, so, so, so that's what you should have in mind. That's, that's what the model is going to capture here. Okay, so that's, we're gonna have the same model that we had earlier on, right? So, this is a subjective expected utility model. And all we're gonna say here is that, you know, there's this tax um, that you place on the returns from an identity incongruent action, right? So the marginal utility from an extra dollar that I gain when my team is playing is much higher than the marginal utility of an extra dollar from when my team loses, right? That's how you should think about this. So there's this tax, like money that I spend from an oil and gas company that doesn't feel just as good as uh, money that comes from uh, a green company. So that's how the model is working. That's how we're capturing the psychic cost, um, right? And so uh, I think I explained all of this. This is going to be relative to the cases where you're neutral. So you can think of alpha being equal to zero when uh, folks are uh, neutral and then just collapse this back to the earlier model that we had, okay? so. If we do the same exercise we saw for the first order conditions, this is the proposition that we get. That if this is indeed a tax, then a fan of a home team, um, of the home team, is going to overinvest in the home team's, um, in a home team asset uh, than a neutral fan would do. Do the same exercise. The overinvestment comes from this extra term. So if you're a home team supporter, you're going to do the same thing that a neutral person does, but then you're gonna have this extra term over here. Again, there's nothing fancy happening here. You can again think of this as an OLS regression where I showed you what's happening here. Um, and then if you look closely here, um, everything that you have here, so this is a negative value here, that's a negative value, and so this is positive, so you're going to put more uh, on the home team winning, and then the reverse is happening here and put less on the away team winning if you support the home team. Right? So that's all that's going on here. The same exercise is happening. We're going to run those same regressions. Um, and what we care about here is pinning down what this tax amount is. You know, how much are you sort of like 
underestimating the amounts that you're getting from um, an identity incongruent action. Right? So these are what the um, taxes look like. Because we have data set, we have a data on the individual for multiple cases, so we have a panel data set on individuals, we can actually estimate the risk aversion parameter for at the individual level. But here we estimated um, sort of a single parameter for across all the people. Um, and the tax is about 11 or 12% in the UK uh, and 9% in Kenya. When you use the individual uh, level um, risk preferences, it jumps in Kenya, the tax jumps in Kenya. Why? Because um, the average risk aversion in Kenya is much higher. And you, if you think of the model, the higher your risk aversion is, the higher your tax is going to be. And that's why um, the tax jumps to almost 27% uh, in Kenya and then 17% in um, the UK. So those are the taxes. So again, you should think of this taxes as the preferences, right? Because I'm saying that a dollar from my team winning is worth a dollar, but a dollar from my team losing, you know, it's not really worth a dollar, right? And so that's about preferences. I prefer a dollar versus 73 cents, right? Um, and so that's how you should be thinking. So this is more about preferences rather than the beliefs. Um, okay, so, um, so, so, so essentially now we've gotten the preference aspect of things. We've seen how beliefs also impacts uh, choices. Um, so let's think about one more exercise here before we sort of disentangle this 20% gap that we saw earlier, right? Okay, so now let's think of asset performance dynamics and then identity preferences, right? So essentially what I'm gonna ask here is what's the relationship um, between identity preferences and team performance, right? So team performance can just be literally in the last game how, you know, how well did your team perform? And does that impact what the tax is? Or could, and then we're gonna think of a more of a medium run measure. So what happens in the Premier League is that um, all the teams get ranked. So you get one who's all the way at the bottom um, and then one who's all the way at the top. The last three actually get dropped so that other people can actually move up into, into the league. So we're gonna look at how the previous league, so every team that comes into the, into the league has a ranking. We're gonna see how their ranking impacts the tax um, value that we estimate. And also how the, if your team just performed terribly, how does that also perform, uh, affect um, this tax preference? So all the, the short run um, effect on the tax and this, this sort of medium run effect, all these are coming from the same regression, right? And so assess that, how does your tax change if your team in the previous uh, game just lost the game. No, if your team won the previous uh, match, it decreases um, the tax by almost 9.6%, uh, right? Now, for the ranking that you have here, one means that this was the top team, and then 17 means that this was the worst team. And so if you estimate what alpha should be, which is the tax rate, um, so the tax rate is much higher for teams that suck versus teams that, that do really well. So it's this idea that you know, if your team sucks, you know, your preference for it. I mean, of course, it seems to be like there's some selection going on here because a person who decides to support a team that sucks uh, probably really, really also, also has something to prove. So they're willing to throw away more money uh, for their team to show their loyalty. But, but it's, it's in line with the short run version as well, right? Like, this one is also saying if your team just lost, you know, you sort of like boost your, your, your support for, for, for that team. Let's see, seven minutes here. Okay, so um, we have a tax rate that goes between about uh, 17 to 27%. Um, and then, you know, uh, good performance is also associated with these uh, lower identity um, taxes, right? So people are sort of gang-ho uh, when your team sucks uh, more, than, more than when your team uh, performs well. But we set out today thinking about how beliefs and preferences by themselves impact choices, right? So now we have everything from our model. We have the beliefs, we have uh, the preferences, and now we're going to uh, distinguish between you know, the, the influence of both of these mechanisms on uh, final choices. So this is the exercise here. Um, imagine that I take Dean, um, and then because I know, I know Dean's risk preferences, right? Um, I know what the alpha is, and I'm gonna open Dean's head, fix his risk preferences, 
right, the budget and everything that he has, and then I'm going to put in Dean's head the beliefs of someone who's neutral, right? And then I'm going to ask the model to tell me how much would Dean place on the home team uh, winning, right, the team that he supports, right? So now I've turned Dean into somebody who's neutral, uh, used this, fixed his risk preferences and all other things, and then Dean is going to put about 42, um, let's say $42 on the home team winning. Now I open up Dean's head, and then I'm going to say, well, I'm going to keep everything still the same. The only thing that I'm going to sh change here is that I'm going to go into the distribution of beliefs for the people who are supporters and then take one of um, their thoughts and then place it in the Dean's head, and then I'm going to see, well, now if we add, everything is still the same. Only thing that I'm changing is Dean's beliefs, right? The preference is everything. Again, here, realize because Dean is neutral, the alpha doesn't kick in here. Right, alpha doesn't kick in here. Here, only thing that I'm changing is Dean's beliefs, so alpha hasn't kicked in here. Right? So his preferences are still the same, but if I change his beliefs and make him a supporter, give him a supporter's beliefs, it jumps from 42% to uh, 43%. Right? Remember, the budget is 100, so we can think of this as even percentages. Um, OK, so now we, we, we can say, well, now we've given Dean supporter beliefs, but everything is the same. But then we're going to add the extra uh, preference parameter that we have here, which is the alpha. So now Dean, Dean is going to value um, a money from his team losing much lower than he would um, if he were a supporter. And then once you include that in there, um, that jumps from 45 to 52 percent. So essentially, if we were just looking at this data from the beginning, we would go from 42 to 52, but we wouldn't know what that, what that composition is, you know, what part of that jump from 40, 42 to 52, which is that 10, you know, what part of it is coming from uh, beliefs and what part of it is coming from preferences. And this exercise um, allows us to do that. You could have also thought of the other way where I could have given Dean an alpha first before uh, uh, giving Dean, Dean um, an, an S, uh, uh, well, the supporter's preferences here. Um, when we go to Kenya, things are a little bit different because again, remember we're doing this at the individual level and each person has their own preferences, right? So the Dean is gonna put about 50% on uh, the home team winning, 54% uh, of his budget once I fuse him with supporter preferences and then 60% um, if I include the identity preferences um, in there. Um, yeah, I think I'm almost at the, at the end. So what, what did we do to, uh, so far? So. We came up with a framework to think about you know, how identity impacts investment choices. Um, the way that we thought about this is we're going to have identity impact people's choices in through, through two channels. One is the beliefs, and then one is preferences. And then we use field experiments right, among um, uh, soccer fans. What we found in the reduced form, which is if we just run the experiment and we just, want to, we just stop there, we're going to see this 20% supported neutral investment gap, right? so folks who support uh, folks tend to put more money towards their, the team that they support or the team that they identify with. Uh, but then our goal was to essentially explain what that gap um, meant in terms of people's beliefs and then uh, people's preferences. Um, and then we also found out that you know, people are more over-optimistic uh, when their team uh, is playing than when they're neutral. And then our structural model essentially allowed us uh, to pin down the part of that 20% gap that we saw that's coming from beliefs. So about 20, 30 to 44% of uh, this supporter neutral gap comes from uh, beliefs, and then the rest we attributed towards um, identity preferences. And then we also had this heterogeneity um, in identity preferences where, you know, if your team, so if your team sucks, then your identity taxes is much higher, you're sort of gung-ho. Um, or if your team just lost the previous game. Um, so that was sort of like this medium versus uh, short run dynamics and asset performance. Uh, and I'm going to stop there. I think that's all I have for you this afternoon. Happy to take questions. Yep. You mentioned heterogeneity and identity preferences. Was there? Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, you mentioned uh, heterogeneity in the identity preferences. Was there any similar heterogeneity in the beliefs? So, like, were people at the were fans at the top end of the table more over optimistic in their beliefs than at the bottom end, or was there any heterogeneity in that aspect? So, so yes. Um, 
we didn't address this in, in this paper um, because if you, if you realize the, the preferences, the beliefs part of this exercise was quite black box. I just measured the beliefs and I didn't tell you about how they're forming. But what you find in the data is, so you can, what you find in the data is when the future is forecasted to be good for your, for your team, right? So the probability of your team is greater than um, 50%. Right, people are literally on par with um, the bookmaker. Their beliefs don't deviate. But then, when your team is forecasted to do uh, terrible, you see that the bookmaker's belief beliefs about the performance of your team is going low, but it also stays flat. Right. So people, this idea of overconfidence, you only turn it on when the future is forecasted to be terrible for your team, but you're perfectly like, your beliefs are perfectly aligned. You're not, cra well, I shouldn't use crazy. Um, <laughs> um, you're not, you're not um, your forecasts are more terrible when the future is uh, forecasted to be terrible for your team uh, uh, than not. But, so that's what we find. So I think there's something interesting there um, where you're, you're literally, you're fine when, when, if, when the future. Thank you very much, Kubena. That was a fascinating talk and really, really interesting. Thank you so much. I'm just struggling to understand the element of inherent bias among those who are involved in sports, any sort of sports bet. Would you say that their identity, beliefs, etc., sh shapes a, a bias, or does it shape a behavior that leans more towards doing a particular action or vice versa? I just need to understand if if there's any bias that exists within particular behavior, because if someone naturally supports a team, they would inherently support a particular team, go back to their home team instead of home and away. So to what extent does bias fit within this particular structure? Um, so I, I am hesitant to use um, the word bias here. Um, because of, uh, um, I, I don't know if you know Doug Bernheim, but I'm, I'm hesitant to use it because when he uses it, he said, well, then you're saying that the person is making a mistake. Um, I'm hesitant to say that people are making mistakes here because I don't want to make any welfare claims. Um, so maybe it's perfectly rational to be so loyal that you're winning, willing to burn money. Um, so, so I'm hesitant to say that Clearly, people are, if all you cared about was to maximize the amount of money in your pocket, then you're definitely burning money here. But if it's worth it to burn money so that you feel more loyal, then, then that's not necessarily welfare reducing. And therefore, people are not necessarily biased. So I didn't answer your question. But, um, <laughs> but um, I guess the point that I'm making is I'm not even sure if people are biased here. Is that helpful? OK, yeah. Because I, I, yeah, I'm not making any welfare claims here. The talk. Uh, I had a quick question about like introducing um, interdependence, I guess, among the, the people who bet. Do you think that would add like a third channel, like herding behavior, or do you think of others would be more through like changing your belief, actually affecting your preferences, or maybe both. Yeah. Um, so, so I would say the way you should think about this study is that most of the things that we're finding here is like an underestimate because this is a case where you're making all these decisions privately. It's on your phone or on a computer uh, somewhere, and so you don't have the other fans of Man Man City around you when you're when you're making this decision. So I would say I would think that these things, um, uh, I, I think the gap that we're trying to explain might be bigger, but I, I, I don't know how to speculate in terms of like what the proportions as to beliefs versus preferences would look like in that, in that, in that world. But I think the gap that we're trying to explain might be bigger. And yeah, but yeah, I suspect that if your, your other fans are around you, Gave more in, 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 in this way. This was just in time, too. So, um, any.
any further questions by anyone? Thank you so much, this was terrific. And there is a reception right at the TPP space for everyone, so look forward to seeing you. Thank you all so much.